This is Pinnacle Lutheran Church Sunday Bible Study. The following session was recorded on Sunday, January 13th, 2013. Revelation, Chapter 6. Hey, Pastor, I was just going over Daniel this past week, and I realized that I, I didn't quite remember it all, but I realized that he's given the prophecies of the end time. Daniel and Zechariah are, are hugely influential in the book of Revelation. So, where do they fit in? Um, their prophecies in this? They're the, they're the same. Oh, okay. They're the same. The, 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 a lot of times the prophecies that you'll see in Daniel, depending on where they are, as well as the prophecies that are in the book of Zechariah, are going to be, they're going to be prophecies of, of you know, the best way to explain it is, is, is like this. There are two last days in the scriptures. Okay? Now I know that makes, you know, that may make, you know, our, your head spin, but there are two last days in the sense that, okay, one last day is the death of Christ because on that last day, what ends? Sin's dominion. The devil's reign on earth. Okay? It's done and, and, and that reality is brought to earth. Okay? The second last day, what will there be a lack of? Sin. Complete sin. That will be the death of all and the resurrection of the dead from the grave. Okay? So when you look at Zechariah's and, and Daniel's prophecies, you know, more more often than not, and you you can determine this by the context. Um, Daniel and Zechariah are going to be foreshadowing the prophecies of Christ coming. Okay, what John's doing here is he's saying is, is that is he's basically what it does is it reveals to us God hasn't changed. The way that he's working is not is not going to be any di is not going to be different. He's going to save us in these last days in the same ways that he saved us in the days of old. He's going to comfort us in the same way. And what it does is it reminds us of the certainty and the comfort and and all of those different things. Does, does that make does it make sense so far? I guess uh, there's a lot. There's a lot in it. Yeah. You're, you're on to something exactly because you know the prophecies of the Old Testament are the same as the prophecies of the New Testament, most specifically is what we're seeing in the book of Revelation. Okay. So we'll get into that a lot more. <laughs> All right. Good morning, everybody. Um, I, I'm going to try to stay in this area a little bit. Um, we had a choir member that gave me that, that was getting that was how do I want to say who was missing having to go to choir and not being able to to fill out the entire Bible study. So we're going to start recording these things on MP3s. And if I'm repeating myself a lot, it's just so that you know it's for the sake and the posterity of of the recording, so that we understand what's going on, and that way we don't have to have you guys sign waivers and stuff like that. I'll just repeat the question, um, and it'll be there for the, the recording. Um, we got into, last week, the beginning of the prophecy uh, in the book of Revelation, and, I, and we spent almost the entire hour, uh, or 45 minutes, talking about the white horse. Um, having had a week now to let this sort of sink in and simmer, um, how is everybody doing with uh, with the white with the white horse? Questions, concerns. Well, as a choir member, I left before we finished the white horse. Oh, you did? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. I'm sorry about the white horse confusion. <laughs> what what chapter is this? Six, Revelation six. Let's let's look at it again, and then and then for the sake of those who missed the latter part of of the of the meet or of the, the Bible study, um, we'll we'll review it and then uh, see if we have any any questions. And then I do, if we can, um, I do want to just talk about the remaining three horsemen. And then more than likely we're going to we won't be able to have much more time than just to be able to discuss those, and we'll start to get into. Revelation 6, probably 7 through the rest of the, uh, the chapter next week. Okay, Let's look at it uh, here. If, if somebody would volunteer to read uh, Revelation 6, and we'll do verses 1 through um, let's do through 11. 
Uh, now I watched the Lamb open the one of the seven seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures say with a voice like thunder, Come. And I looked, and behold, a white horse and its rider had a bow, and a crown was given to him. And he came out conquering to conquer. When he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, Come. And out came another horse, bright red. Its rider was permitted to take peace from the earth, so that people should slay one another. And he was given a great sword. When he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come. And I looked, and behold, a black horse, and its rider had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard what seemed to be a voice in the midst of the four living creatures, saying, A quart of wheat for a denarius, and three quarts of barley for a denarius, and do not harm the oil and wine. When he opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature say, Come. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse. And its rider looked, and behold, um... Uh, and its writer's name was Death, and Hades followed him, and they were given authority over a fourth of the earth to kill with the sword, with sword and, and with famine, and with, pens, with pestilence and by wild beasts of the earth. And when he opened the fifth seal, I saw the altar, the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the witness they had borne. They cried out with a loud voice, O Sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? They, then they were each given a white robe and told to rest a little longer until the number of the fellow servants and their brothers should be complete, who were to be killed as they themselves had been. Okay. Um, so... Who wants to take a stab at uh, what we had arrived at with regard to who the white rider is, or what rather the white the white rider is, and how we know it? We see, and just to give you a, 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 a to give you some clues, um, we look at we look at some of the characteristics that are of the white horse. Um, <clears throat> We know that there's going to be elegance. There's going to be um, he's going to be coming at, at it in white, um, which is it's a it's a color that's been given, which is is symbolic of purity and divinity. Um, uh, he's going to be. Let's see. I just I, I want to double check something before I speak. Okay. So then, and then another thing too that we want, we want to remember is that he was given the crown, he was given the bow, and his number, his job was to, to was for conquest. And what we want to want to keep in mind is that the the prophecy here to John is is is, is he saying, okay, temporally, here on earth, this side of heaven, this is what's going to happen between the ascension of Christ and the last day when Christ comes again. These things are going to happen temporally. And so when he explains and he says that there's going to be a white horse, what he's saying is temporally he's going to have certain appearances, he's going to have certain qualities, he's going to do certain things, and he's bringing things with him. It's, and it's very difficult because I think one of the things that, that, that we have a, a difficult time distinguishing is when the scriptures are making temporal temporal allusions and or or um, what do I want to say temporal prophecies or spiritual prophecies um, and and prophecies that deal more with the right hand kingdom of God. So it's it's really a distinction, and I'm going to throw throw something out there for you. A distinction where where we have to properly understand the distinction between the kingdom of the right and the kingdom of the left. And when I say that, neither one of the kingdoms is greater than or less than the other. It's just important for distinction is to say we live temporally in the kingdom of the left, the left-hand kingdom. Um, and that's, that's okay. The right-hand kingdom is the kingdom where, you know, and the, re the easy way to remember this is to say, okay, at, at one day, 
Um, not yet, and full, we don't fully see it yet. We will sit at the right hand of God. That's an easy way to remember it, is to say the kingdom of the right is the heavenly kingdom. Okay, And that's what we need to remember here in the book of Revelation, is that God through John and God through his prophecy is making those distinctions and, if, and, that, and I, I apologize that I didn't explain this to you guys last week, is to say these distinctions are important. For right now, John is being dealt with in terms of the kingdom of the left. That's still not explaining to you who this white horse, per, this white horse person is. Mrs. Flick. Well, uh, right now, I, I maybe cheat a little bit because I used this. <laughs> but for that, with the white horse, now I'm getting a little confused with even their explanation here. Okay. They say one, Christ, okay. is with them. And then they go two, the Antichrist. Uh -huh. And three, the spirit of conquest through the preaching of the word of God. The latter establishes a more natural sequence with the other three riots, which symbolize bloodshed, famine, and death. Okay. As a bow, a battle weapon, and crown. Now, in the beginning, it did mention, you know, the white horse and mm -hmm. symbolizes, like you said, conquest, victory, and purity. So mm -hmm. that's where I, with saying purity, that's where I got the Christ. Right. But then, then it says Antichrist. Right. Right. Now and, I'm confused. Yeah. It, it, right. <laughs> and and I and I know exactly where that where that came from, and or you know, vice versa. The. The commentary that I'm using for the study on Revelation, it, 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 says this, it says the same thing. Now, here's the thing. I'm going to give you the inside scoop on theologians, you know. <laughs> um, you know, we're kind of, what, the reason that that would be brought up is to say, okay, there are prominent theologians who would, who would say that this is the Christ. And there's good reason for us to think that it would be. The writer... On the white uh, horse. A being Christ. Christ. Now, now, I say that tongue-in-cheek right now, mm -hmm. okay? Because the third one is the most convincing of it all by virtue of the context of the entire scriptures, okay? So there is compelling reason for us to believe or, or somebody to be led to believe that it would be the Christ. Why? Well, he's coming in white. Christ is shown to be one who's coming in white. But there's something that makes, the, that makes it not compelling. Okay, and you have to know then what's happening, and I, can, I can't remember where it is in Revelation 19, but there's a section in Revelation 19 which shows us and reveals to us the Christ coming alone with it. Go ahead. 19 verse 11. 19, 11, what does it say? What, can you read it for us? Well, one of the things is, Christ with a bow seems inconsistent with that. Right. Yeah. Yep. Right. I mean, if, from my point of view. Right. And, and, and Christ is ascribed a weapon. There are times where Christ is ascribed a weapon. In, in Luke's gospel, most specifically, he carries a sword. And it's a sword that he brings to bring division, not peace. Uh, and, and the sword that he's bringing, it's a figurative sword. It's not a steel sword. Luke goes on to explain it then later. He says, the sword is the gospel. And what he's saying is that what will divide people is not, not that we're going to be, have our heads lopped off, but it, what he's saying is that what's going to divide people is that throughout the history of, of mankind, until he comes again, we're not going to agree about, on what the Bible says. The interpretation of people. Uh -huh. they interpret it on the but it's a very interesting thing, and, I, and just a real quick aside on that. I met with a Baptist pastor on Friday who had emailed me and he said, I want out. I want out of the Baptist church. A Baptist pastor. And he said, there's nothing, you know, you go to a different, you go to a Baptist church and we're not saying, the same, we're not saying anything that's, that's the same. Some of you who were at the evening prayer service on Monday, you may have noticed that there were some, this, there were some similarities in Pastor Worshmitt's preaching and my preaching. <laughs> we say the same thing. That's a very close indication and, and shows us that, the, that, that, that there is no division between the men in your confession. 
And that's why we say, and, and we say we must hold to, and the reason that we're, we're saying the same things is because it all comes from here. We're all reiterating what it is that that scripture says, and we can be assured that at this Lutheran church here in, Pin, in, in Rochester, that I'm going to be preaching, in essence, the same thing as the guys in Fort Wayne, as the guys in St. Louis, as the guys here throughout all... When I, when, now when I throughout all quote-unquote confessional Lutheran churches. We're going to all be preaching the same sermon today. It's all going to be about the baptism of our Lord, and we're all going to be saying essentially the same thing. Okay? I don't know how I got there, and I can't rewind the tape. Can somebody help me to remind, remind me how we got there? Well, I have a question within there. Sure. Um, so you're saying that um, white horse is, is the devil or... The Antichrist, basically, and, he th and the angel is, angel, is that the angel? The creatures are saying that to come out, so they're commanding the, the devil to do this? Okay, what, no. I remember where we were now. Okay, oh, good. And, and, and he'll answer, yeah, you did, you helped me. <laughs> um, Jeff, you were going to read 1911 uh, yeah, sure. through 13. Um, okay, here's the rider on the white horse. I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse, whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and makes war. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. He is dressed in a robe, dipped in blood, and his name is the Word of God. Okay. So what we see there... And it, it, it's sort of a deduction. We have to deduce and say, okay, in Revelation 6, we see a white horse coming. But he's coming with other riders. The white horseman in Revelation 19 comes, does he come with others? No. Nope. He comes by himself. Well, it says, the next verse, though, says, and the armies of heaven arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on right. white horses. Right, right. The, there's an important distinction there, though. It's like the Calvary okay. coming. What's that? It's like the Calvary coming. Well, mm -hmm. the army that follows him is us. Christ is firstborn. Christ is firstborn from the dead. Christ is... For it, Christ is the first to open the kingdom, uh, the, open the doors of heaven. We're going to hear about that today in, in the sermon. You know, the kingdom of heaven was opened over the waters of the Jordan River. He was there to fulfill all righteousness on our account. He did these things for us. He was the first one in everything that he did. He was the first one for us so that we may know kind of what it's going to look like going ahead. And we see it in Revelation 19. Victory has been won. This is after all of the, all of the cosmic battles have taken place on earth after the glory has been fulfilled when we see him face to face etc so on there will be the armies that follow him so going back to what mrs flick had said yes you know people can say well we think it might be the christ but in knowing what the scriptures say you can say no it's it couldn't possibly be that because these horsemen come abreast to each other meaning they ride side by side yes they are coming in an order but they come together side by side. And that's one of the things where we remember, no, Christ comes by himself. He's always alone in what it is that he's doing, and he's always alone to do these things for us. Jeff, did you have a question? Uh, well, I have a note here in my Bible that mm -hmm. might help clarify um, chapter 6 a little bit. Sure. Um, it's saying, uh, because the other three horses relate to judgment and destruction, this rider and a white horse would most likely not be Christ. The four are part of the unfolding judgment of God, and it would be premature for Christ to ride as the fourth as conqueror. Mm -hmm. Other horses represent different kinds of judgment, red for warfare and bloodshed, black for famine, pale for death. Yeah, and then that's, that's, that's a very good explanation. That's another one of the things, too, is to say... Christ has not, Christ at this particular point in Revelation, remember the victory's already been won. He's not coming, he's, he's, not, he's not coming necessarily for, for, I need to backtrack here. Um, I'm getting wrapped up in my own spokes here. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
Okay. With regard to okay, what Je what Jeff's talking about here is that he's saying it's too early in the prophecy for Christ to be coming for judgment, because we know that Christ coming in judgment comes at the end of time. Okay. It's too late. It's too early because we've all only started to begin with the prophecy of the judgment that is to come. Okay. So it's basically saying. Christ is going to see over all of these things. He's the one that's in control of them. They have limitations. But the judgment that's going to come is not going to come until is not going to come until later. Okay? To this, with regard to the second one. With it, with, with it being the Antichrist. Okay? You can look at it and you can say, yes, there are compelling reasons for us to believe that it would be the Antichrist, because temporally. He's coming in white, but it's a deceptive white. He's coming with the appearance of being virtuous, pure, and holy. Okay? I, I, I have a tendency to believe that that's a somewhat compelling case. That, but I think it's more compelling to say that the Antichrist has a hand in what's going on. Well, if he's riding with, uh, with the red horse next and so forth, then they're compatriots and they're going to be killing. Right. Right. All but, of them. Right. So you right, and you look at it and you say, okay, so the white, you know, the white horse, you know, it's better look to look at it and say these four horsemen who are coming are a byproduct of what Satan did to Adam and Eve in the garden. That's what I think is the most compelling case. You know, the third one that you had read, Mrs. Flick, which is what we've talked about with regard to conquest and with regard to you know overlording, etc., so on, and this is ultimately who the horseman is. The horseman is us. The horseman is our society. The horseman is the principle that is the principle of virtue on the surface, which only seeks to have conquest over another person. In other words, you know, the white horseman is when I go to somebody and, and on the face of things, I look virtuous white, clothed in white, etc., so on, and all that I do, but all I really want is something from you. That's a very simple way of putting it, okay? The bows, the bows and the conquest and the crown, one of the things that we're looking at, this is not a crown of righteousness. This is a crown that we're wearing in order that the conquest would be, would be clear and that I would one day stand over you. The Crusades are a good example. Yeah, absolutely. You know, uh, fundamentalist Christians. Um, not only that, but then atheist groups. It doesn't matter. You know, any time that we would have, you know, a, a husband who looks to, to lord over his wife. Um, a woman who, who looks to have control over her body. That's, <laughs> we're trying to have conquest over things which we were not given to have conquest over. And it's very difficult for us to understand in our modern, quote-unquote, enlightened minds. Because we look at it and we say, well, it's been this way for as long as I can remember. I've always had it like this. There's never been a time that I can remember that abortion was, you know, just for one, to put my finger on one thing, which is never controversial. <laughs> There's never been a time in my life that abortion hasn't been legal. I was born in 1978. Abortion's been around five years longer than I've been around. And trying to then convince people of the reality that, you know, we don't have juris jurisdiction over these things. And, the, and what's interesting is the, is the fact that, 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 you know, that the arguments have gone to the place now where we, we, we um, support of it is, well, we want somebody to be able to have conquest and or jurisdiction over their own bodies. We've taken it to different extremes with regard to controlled euthanasia, physician-assisted suicide. We do not have jurisdiction over ourselves. And I know that's very hard to understand as Americans because we've been told from the very beginning that we are the lords of whatever. We are the ones that are in control. We're not. God is in control. 
And that's what Revelation 6 reminds us. He says, these things are going to happen. The white horsemen are coming. We are the white horsemen. And what's even more, more stark about it is that we don't even know we're the white horsemen. And further, you look at it and you say, we have to go back and read who's in charge of the white horsemen. Who's opening the seals? Jesus. Yeah, the Lamb. And not only that, but who's there attending to us as the seals are being opened and revealed to us? The angels, the messengers are there with us. So what, what this starts to reveal to us is that it, you know, it very articulately um, illustrates that fancy Latin phrase we Lutherans like to throw around. Simul justus et peccato. Simultaneously saint and sinner at the same time. Revelation 6 exposes to us that, yes, we are the ones redeemed. Revelation 1 through 5 showed us that. But it also shows us that we, to the extent that these things, you know, that we exhibit, you know, the, the, the qualities of conquest over our own selves or over other people, and we do so with the, the guise of virtue. And you look at it, I and mean, once again, to put my finger on the hot button issue of abortion, the pro choice argument is very compelling and very virtuous, isn't it? We care about women. And you clearly don't, if you don't support us. We can talk about that, and I think we should at another time. But just look at it as to say, there are going to be times where, where arguments will be compelling and will seem virtuous, but they are so wrong. And it's very difficult. And that's, what, that's what's being talked about here in the very first part of the very first horseman. And it's very diff it's very the other horsemen fall into place with regard to this. He's basically saying this is the result of sin. These things are going to happen. So Mrs. Flick finally to answer before you go off. <sighs> it's safe to say that these things in this horseman is yes, the antichrist has had had a hand in it, but this is the cumulative effect of sin in our lives. That's the, uh, that's the most compelling thing that I, I can see from, from this particular part of Revelation. So I hope that, I hope that clarifies for you a little bit. Uh, and well, I'm, I'm thinking here because you're saying that all of the horses were coming all together. Yes. They are. So how do I want to say this then? Uh, but Christ comes alone mm -hmm. in in white. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm Later, trying. Christ comes. I'm trying to. Uh, yeah. I don't know. I don't know what I'm trying to may, do, maybe, maybe it's like, I mean, to think about it like this. They come, they come abreast to each other. In other words, okay, Christ comes alone for a purpose. To, to, to be the judge. And we as the baptized know that the judgment's already been rendered. It's the wrath of God has been taken out on Jesus. Our verdict is innocent by virtue of the blood of Christ. He comes forward solely to, just, to, to, to give that. To us, okay. These four are coming together, and collective. So that Christ is not the white horse at that time. No, no, it's us. Yeah, we're looking at it, and yes, because and it's Antichrist. It's no. No, 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 no. It's not. So you look at it, and you say, they're coming collectively, side by side, for the for the sole purpose of doing these things cumulatively over the period of time that spans. The ascension to the eschaton. So when he, Christ comes again, and then we'll be following Christ. Yes, that's what's happening. As you see, the four horsemen come here within the ascension to the eschaton. This time we live in now the last days. Revelation 19. So here's okay. So here's the eschaton. Okay, we're, we've run up into this. The four horsemen don't have any any jurisdiction over here. Remember what Christ is reminding us is he's saying, I am the triumphal one. I am the, the white horse. You are the armies of heaven. You will be following me this side of the eschaton. Even now we're still doing it. But we see it by faith. 
Okay, so we see that we are the armies of Christ here in the midst of these things. Yes, and that's why Revelation 1 through 5 is so important because John spends five chapters saying, you're saved, you're saved, you're redeemed, you're bought and paid for. You are this, you are the ones in white clothing, you are the ones in the crowns, you are the ones, you are the ones, Christ is your Lord. Get ready because this, what I'm going to tell you is going to rock your world. Get ready, get ready, get ready, behold. And, and you can start to see, you know, just we've only spent, you know, we're only four verses into the prophecy. And what it is that, that you know, sin does and how, you know, that disconnect that, that sin has brought to us from the word of God. How rampant it is. And it's okay for us to talk as in-depth as we can about this because, you know, we don't want to. We don't want to leave here with multiple consent, with multiple ideas about what this could mean. We must know what it does mean, because there is, you know, when we do know what it does mean, there's comfort. If we don't know and we can't come to an agreement or a consensus, then there's confusion. You know, and we start to look at it and say, and we can start to forget that, you know, you know. Say somebody would say, yeah, I believe that this horseman is Christ. Uh, you can be led off into all sorts of weird stuff. <laughs> you know, oh, or you believe that it's, you know, if you start to believe that the horseman is the Antichrist, I, yeah, by the way. I, I you know, holy you cow. I mean, no, then all of a sudden we're off the hook. We can't be off the hook. We're guilty as sin of these particular things. And that's what we need to be so reminded weird, of. So in order that we can see the both and. We are sinners, yes. But we are saved. And by virtue of being saved, we can start to understand things like grace. That God is gracious. And what does is, what is his being gracious mean? It means we don't deserve this. But did he give it anyway? Of course he did. Why? Because he loves us and he promised to do so. And if he promised to do so, then it shows us that he's a man of his word. And all of a sudden you start to see how different things start to fall into their nice little categories. If we can trust his promises, then we can trust his word. And if we can trust his word, then we can go out and be confident. And if we can be confident, then we can be certain that whether we live or whether we, et cetera, so on. Everything starts to fall into its place. But then I have to remind, I'm reminded then of what Pastor Worshman preached to us on Monday, you guys hear the same story over and over and yawn and yawn and Advent and Christmas and come on, can we do something new? But Pastor Worshman explained to us why it is that the story repeats and we hear the same thing over and over again. Do you remember? Because we forget. You know, the disciples in the boat it's one of my favorite stories in all of Scripture. But as you, you know, says, and I explained this to the, catechism, to the catechism class today. You know, the, one of them said, uh, you know, so the boats, the storm's going, and the boat's going, and the disciples are there, and they're terrified. They don't know what's going on. And, and they wake Jesus up, and he calms the storm. And then one of the catechism class said, why are they afraid? Didn't they trust? I mean, they're his disciples. Shouldn't they know who Jesus is? Yeah, but they don't. Well, it always reminds me, too, of when I was reading the Bible in the Old Testament, how the, they always went away from Christ, yeah. then they come back to Christ, then yeah. they go away from Christ. Now, the important caveat with that is, is that the, they're not the ones coming back. It's kind of like, and I'll just use our soon-to-be seminary, and hopefully they grab him by the ear, and he drags him back and says, your kingdom is here. Stay. It's a kingdom of eternal life, eternal feeding, eternal care, eternal love, eternal gratitude, eternal grace, eternal mercy, eternal this, eternal... <sighs> ah, we're not, had enough. And then all of a sudden you start to see it. The nation of Israel wanders again. Yeah. And you start to look at it, and you're absolutely right, Mrs. Flick. We are, the nation of Israel continues. I'm the nation of Israel. And it's important to remember, God's own beloved, chosen one who... The promises are for, but I walk away from them all the time. They're already mine. 
I don't need to do anything to get them. You know, I am an heir of the kingdom. Why? Because God loved me. That's what John 3.16 tells me. He did so much that he gave his own son for me. He you know, his own son die. And why we walk? I don't know. I don't know why. I mean, I do. I mean, we walk because of sin. And repeatedly, repeatedly, through the Word, through the Holy Spirit, through the church, through, these, through His means, we're brought sometimes kicking and screaming back into His midst. Sometimes it's every week brought back kicking and screaming. And... Amen. Yeah, it's, it, it, you know, that it's... That, so that's, yeah, that's where we're at. And I hope, like I said, Mrs. Flick, that that, you know, embodies it a little bit more but, you know, one of the things we realize is that, you know, from these particular studies, you know, yes, we're given certainty, but a lot of times more questions come. Yeah. Right. That's a good thing. Because you start to, when you start to understand that there are questions, it's not a showing that we have a lack of faith. It's, it's more a testament to showing us just how deep and rich and depthy the knowledge, the wisdom, and the mercy, and the grace of God are. That's what it shows us. Not that we're lacking faith, necessarily. Although we might be. But it shows us just how deep these things are. And guess what? They're for us. And as we continue to dig and ask those questions, I told the seventh graders yesterday, I said, you guys, listen. I said, if you can't make mistakes and you can't ask questions in your church, where can you? You know, this is, a safe, this is a safe place in the sense, and I, like that's what I was telling the children, I said, uh, it's a safe place in the sense that, you know, you can, you can make your mistakes here, and, and, and I'm going to tell you when you're making a mistake. One of the, one of the young ladies, she said, well, Justin Bieber's kind of like God, because, you know, God probably just wants to, you know, wants society to have somebody to look up to. And I said, where does it say that in Scripture? <laughs> I said, I said, sir, I said, no, I said, does it say that in the Bible? And she said, yeah, yeah, it does. I said, where? Can you show me? I mean, I'd love to be able to see it. Really? You want to see Justin Bieber be a to Christ? <laughs> Let's just say I, I know what's in there. Oh. <laughs> and I know he's not mentioned at all. <laughs> so I, I, you know. I know that was an unfortunate <laughs> turn. <laughs> but, to, but to take that step back is to say, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't, you know, slapping the yardstick down on the table and, and, and pointing the finger in the scowl, but it's saying, in essence, well, t tell me why I should believe what you're telling me. Be because I, I, I haven't read that anywhere. <laughs> People, Us Magazine, or the Bible. <laughs> um, and certainly... Everything I've ever understood and read is that God did not come that we would have somebody to look up to and emulate. He came to us in, for, the sole, for the sole purpose of being our Savior. To save us from our sins. Yeah, I mean, you know, in certain instances, uh, it's, it's, it's good to try to emulate and, and to do what Jesus did. But I think a lot of times that, that can get to Christians' heads. You know? I think a you know a WWJD uh, bracelet is a nice idea. I like it. Where I get concerned is you know not just you speak for myself. Where I get concerned is that you know I look at it and I'm like, oh yeah, you're actually an awful lot like Jesus today. I don't. <laughs> God must really really like you because you're acting like Jesus. And then all of a sudden I start to forget. No, He loves me because He's gracious. He loves me because he's merciful. He loves me because he says that he does, and he can't deny his word. Dum dum. You know, I always add my comma and then little you know commentary about myself because this isn't about me. I mean, it is. It is ultimately about me, but it's not about me doing anything to get it. It's all about what Christ has already given. You know, and it's one of the things that it's, it's not a new revelation. I mean, these things aren't new to us. I mean, the fact that they, that they surprise us when we understand that we are the white horsemen, that's a good thing. We need to know we're the white horsemen. Why? So we can stop. It's, it does and fulfills the purpose of the law. And the law's only purpose is, we've talked about this before, um, my keys and then here we go. 
there's two SOSs, and like I've said before, those of you who have been in the adult information class um, already know these. SOS, there's two SOSs. There's a law SOS and a gospel SOS. The, the law's Save only purpose is to show our sin. The gospel's only purpose is to show our Savior. This is showing us our sin. But it is also showing us our Savior. And it's important that we see this for what it, for what it is. And this, this is why, you know, why Peter says to us um, that as Christians, and most specifically, you know, I'm given this charge as, as your pastor, I need to be able to rightly divide the word of truth. 